Hello and welcome to another episode of the Sam Taylor Podcast. My name is Sophia Erdogan and I'll be your guest producer for today's episode. A bit about me, I recently graduated from Dalhousie University with an MBA and have a background in health sciences. During my last term, I had the pleasure of being in Sam's cost management course and as someone with a non-business undergrad, I came to appreciate interdisciplinary knowledge and realized that we can learn something from any industry and apply it to our daily lives. The best example of that is good communication, and today's guest is a master of that skill. In this episode, we're joined by Sheldon McLeod, a multimedia host and producer at the Saltwire Network, and host of his own podcast, Thinking Out Loud with Sheldon McLeod. He tells us his story pursuing a career in the multimedia space and the key skills he gained to be able to facilitate these great conversations with people and get them to open up in a way that you understand them on a much deeper level. He also shares valuable advice on navigating your career path and addressing obstacles from personal experience. Whether you're curious about broadcasting careers, communications, or if you simply love listening to stories, this episode has something for everyone. So tune in and enjoy. Welcome, Sheldon McLeod. Happy to have you here. Well, thank you for inviting me, Sam. All right. So we're going to start off with a hard-hitting question first. You're at a restaurant. You order a sandwich, perhaps a burger, and it comes with a side pickle, but only one side pickle, possibly a half a slice of a side pickle. What do you do with that pickle? And in what order do you do that with? I am a huge pickle fan. I don't know if you've been doing your research, but um, I am 100% pickle. I'm team pickle if you want. And um, I hope that my wife orders a sandwich as well, because then I get her pickle too. So uh, it's it's a, a bite of sandwich, a bite of pickle, get that balance right, and, and maybe a slurp of soup in between. So that's pretty much, the, that's how I roll. I love it. <laughs> I love it. We will get along um, the rest of this interview because I'm also team pickle and my dinner companions, uh, husband included, knows that I will probably eat his pickle first so that my pickle can remain safe. (laughs) Because that's what relationships are all about. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Okay. So Sheldon, you have decades of experience in the multimedia space, and I am so, so thrilled that you're joining us today uh, to speak to management learners at Dalhousie University and abroad. Now, It's hard for me to encapsulate what you've done in one intro, and as a lazy interviewer, I would love to send it on over to you to kind of give us um, an intro about yourself. It can be brief, it can be long, but I just want to know uh, a little bit more about yourself from you. The story is I graduated high school in 1988, uh, not knowing what I wanted to do, and I ended up picking up a few jobs. We had been in Nova Scotia, gone out to Saskatchewan, so I was working in a number of jobs where I'm driving around in delivery trucks or in service vehicles, and I had the radio turned on, and I'm listening to Peter Zosky, and I'm listening to Morningside, and I'm listening to this man communicate and tell stories and talk to people, and I thought, well, that would be a cool job. Uh, So I went to a broadcast school in Regina, Saskatchewan, Uh, ended up uh, graduating from that as uh, most professional, ended up working in uh, radio in Estevan, Saskatchewan. Uh, It was at the start of, uh, well, the 90s when recessions started happening, ended up back and moving back to Nova Scotia, started working at the hometown radio station there, Uh, made a switch at one point from on air to news. So instead of talking in between records after, like, I'm one of those guys who used to work overnights playing real records on a radio, AM radio, Uh, and then went to the newsroom, a buddy of mine, a good friend of mine, he was in news, we sort of swapped positions. uh, And I was working in news from that point on ended up uh, becoming a news director in Bridgewater, by the age of 29, kind of hitting one of those goals. Uh, So I was in charge of a a group of people, a group of journalists, Uh, most of uh, my remaining time in in that medium was spent working as in support roles i ended up working at uh, news 95 7 uh first of all as a reporter then later on i was given an opportunity to be a talk show host uh that ended up being interrupted by the pandemic the company uh, had run into some challenges when everything shut down and advertising revenue had dried up i was one of uh, 10 co-workers who were let go And uh, shortly after that announcement happened, I was approached by Saltwire, by the president of the company, Mark Lever, who said, come and meet with me. 
Uh, he said, I don't really have a job for you, but this is an opportunity hire, so I want you to come in. And from there, uh, it's sort of morphed into this online, uh, not necessarily much, as much just podcasts, but video uh, vlogs, if you will, uh, conversations. That's essentially what I, where I found my perhaps calling is, is helping people be comfortable enough to tell me things that I would probably never share about myself, that it's an opportunity to, you know, explore feelings and, and thoughts. And, and so that's how my little segment became branded uh, thinking out loud, because it's that idea that, you know, it's just a conversation, hopefully it's meaningful enough to make a difference in the world. So there's the, the long version, or the shortened long version of uh, my, my route, my journey to this point. Thank you. You mentioned uh, a number of great things that I'll hopefully be able to link back and incorporate uh, going forward. One thing is, is I would love to know, as somebody who's had, I, I dare say, decades of experience, because it's, it's a wealth of experience to, to have conversations, to keep conversations going. Uh, I think, I believe, one of our previous conversations, you said that you would, you know, be talking in between playing music to people and guests uh, for a couple of hours on end and pull out uh, different streams. So what is one thing that, um, or a couple of tricks that you would use if people are a little bit more shy, a little bit more, you know, reserved? Uh, is there anything to do kind of before or during an interview or a conversation? The key is listening. Uh, it was actually someone else who pointed out to me that I'm a good listener. I didn't really realize that because I wasn't paying attention. Sorry. No, uh, <laughs> but but what, what, what's really evident to me is that people love talking about their favorite subject, which is themselves. And if you're listening and you hear something, or when I hear something that I'm not expecting, uh, there's a mental note. I, I'm kind of a list taker, but they're all mentalists. And I will use that or go back to that. So if you're in a situation where you're a little uncomfortable, maybe a little bit uh, self-conscious. Uh, the easiest way to kind of tamp that down is to ask somebody to talk about themselves. And when that door opens, then it just, if you continually do that and you continue to engage in that way by listening to what they say, engaging them on that with follow-up questions or referring to what they told you, that can take you a long way away. It can, can take you quite far into the, the conversation before you realize you're not nervous anymore. That as long as people are talking about themselves, they'll continue until you stop. Perfect. Okay. And the tie-in to management learners here is that word networking. Now, briefly, when I say networking, what kind of feeling does that elicit for you? For me, uh, collaboration hmm. in a lot of ways. I have had a, a tremendous amount of success by doing one thing and one thing only, which is to rec recognize that people will talk to you if you're, if you're nice. And it sometimes is counterintuitive to what people think journalism is, that it needs to be adversarial, that it needs to be, you know, aggressive. I, I like to say it's a conversation, not an interrogation. Uh, so for me, networking is collaboratively working with the people that can help everyone succeed in that realm, whether it's uh, communications folks, whether it's other people in media, or whether it's, you know, the, the person that you just happen to connect with because of the story that they have to tell. Perfect. Thank you. We um we have these events uh, within our faculty, which I think are great, and there are opportunities for collaborations for students to meet with employers, potential employers, uh, and the way that they're organized sometimes might suggest that there are you know jobs on the line. But really, uh, you know, if we can kind of separate the networking from the job seeking portion. Uh, and I really think that that collaboration opportunity to collaborate, opportunity to communicate, opportunity to lift everybody up, uh, opportunity to explore. So really keep, you know, networking, maybe just swap it with like opportunity, I think is a really good way to frame the discussion. Because when you put yourself out there for a job, it kind of elicits a different set of expectations. You almost think like, oh, there's a power dynamic. Uh, but when really, you know, when you're in these quote networking events, um, you know, as learners with, um, you know, companies that are potentially looking to attract people, oftentimes the employers are nervous too, because they want to, you know, show off their best attributes. They want to make sure that people understand where they're coming from. They want to seem relatable, uh, perhaps. Uh, and so there really is this interesting kind of power dynamic. But if you can strip that all away and say, hey, listen, I'm going to go in and I'm going to have a conversation and I want to hear about people and their experience. And if we compare that to, hey, 
asking them about themselves and their experience with the company and why are you here, you will likely be able to get over those nerves and also learn a lot of really valuable information so that if you want to apply in a job in the future, uh, that you can, or even better yet, you know who you don't want to apply for <laughs> because <laughs> maybe the person's like, I'm here because I'm here. <laughs> Fair point. And I, I think you've opened the door to a, a different mindset, which is not necessarily uh, perhaps presenting all of your best attributes, but asking people, how did you end up there? What was your journey like? What was it about this job that made you want to apply for it? Or how did this company fit with your ethics and morals or perhaps your vision. And I think there's an opportunity there. If you're not necessarily just looking for a job, I think there was a time uh, prior to this labor market where most of the jobs that were available were never advertised. So it was because you had made a, an impression or a connection or, and it's not nepotism as much as it's, you have something to give and someone else recognizes that. And in turn, they give you an opportunity. Absolutely. I think that that is a really good point. Uh, we always, uh, my husband and I talk sometimes about this and I'm like, oh, like you try to look backwards and see, like connect the dots and see like how those things worked out. Uh, because it's really easy to kind of look backwards and like, provide a very like wonderful narrative. Oh, I did this and this happened and this happened. But when you're in it, you're kind of like, I did this <laughs> and this. And it ends up working out like that. So to kind of sum that up is you're kind of interviewing for your next opportunity while you're doing your current job, while you're meeting your current people, like while you might be in your first year classes, you don't know kind of what domino, what might come from that later on. And it's it's pretty cool. And I think that, you know, being curious, being authentic, uh, keeping those lines of communication may come up, you know, sooner than you may think. So thank you for that reframe on uh, networking. Now, I'm so curious, what is the best part of your job? Oh, um, best part is yeah. having this ability or this opportunity to, to talk to people and get paid to do something I like. Uh, it, it's, one th it's a trope that if you really, truly love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, that's not entirely true because I'm not saying it's not work, yeah. but it doesn't feel like a chore. It doesn't feel like oh, again, or, oh, do I have this. to this again? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, just to be able to say that I talk to people for a living, you know, that's really something that's quite, I, I recognize is not available to everyone. Or I guess to put it another way, I've worked hard to get to mm. that opportunity, which is, you know, obviously, uh, it's changed over the years, but there's still a willingness to for people to take a chance on having me open up with other people or have other people open up with me just to, to tell stories and give people some perspective, perhaps they've never really even thought about. Absolutely. Having people learn about themselves in a way that can help others learn about them and themselves and connect with. It's pretty powerful. Uh, on the flip side, Sheldon, uh, what's one of like, maybe the, I don't want to say worse sides, but you know, something that may be part more, more work than, you know, than, than fun. I think one of the, the, the biggest challenges right now is this, I, I was there when the internet started. I was there when people started to talk about the opportunities. I was there when people said it was going to democratize so much of our society from uh, citizen journalism uh, to having a platform, a global platform. In some ways, uh, we've never been so connected with each other via these devices, but yet in many ways we're so alone in some ways that we sometimes crave that connection. So I guess the biggest challenge I see, if I were to put it that way, is that there's so much noise out there to be heard, to cut through the noise and to everyone wants to be relevant. Everyone wants to have the work that they do resonate some way and somehow with some people, but just to get that place in their space, to have them shut down the fire hose long enough for them to respond to what I'm trying to help educate about that, that to me is, and I say it as a challenge, it's not a bad thing. It's just something that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of. And some days I just don't know how to, to fight through that because it's, it's bigger than multimedia. It's bigger than mainstream media. It's, it's really, it's changed human behavior in a way, this huge social experiment that we won't really be able to fully grasp for another 10, 20 years. Although there, there are thinkers, there are people who have it, who know about it right now. Uh, and I, I guess to kind of 
to, to back up that point, I would say there are people who have been able to figure out ways to leverage the media, but it's not helpful. It's not healthy. And in some ways, it's detrimental to our society. I, I'm thinking of the populist movement. I'm thinking about some of this whole, some of these, these actions people are taking because they know it's going to get them a platform and the social media platforms themselves use algorithms that, that reward antagonism, that reward behavior that's, in my humble opinion, uh, not helpful to society. Lots to, lot to unpack uh, there, absolutely. We talked uh, the other day in my cost management class and I asked, what is cost? And um, you know, the, the first one is, oh, it's an economic exchange. It is you know, funds given up. And then we explored that a little bit more. I said, is it just funds? And they said, no. And so we had a you know, first class kind of discussion to lay the foundation for the course. A cost is anything given up. It's time. It's, um, you know, there can be an environmental costs. There can be social costs and uh, there can be attention costs. Really, everything that is given up, you need to look at the cost benefit and as a society and as an individual. You know, I know sometimes as you're speaking, I even get overwhelmed. I'm like, what can I do as an accounting prop, as a business prop? What can I do to contribute? And where I'm at right now in my process is by, you know, being honest and authentic that I don't know the answers. I'm willing to explore. I'm willing to keep an open mind. I and ask myself when I encounter things, does this make me feel better? Uh, is this helping me achieve my mission? And um, and going from there and doing my best to lead by example and hopefully sparking some conversations in, in the future generations because they get a lot of, they have a very interesting, from what I've seen, uh, perspectives in the media that people are like, oh, they're lazy. They just want instant gratification. And I'm like, well, as a millennial, that's what people said about me. <laughs> And like, is it true? Yes. Is it not true? Yes. You know, it just depends on what, um, what lens you're looking at it through. So within that, I have a lot of hope for the future. And I know that one of the ways that I will try to help guide along that uh, generation is by being authentic. When I use the word authentic, uh, how, does, how big of a role does authenticity play in, in your role as, uh, as a multimedia journalist, as, as a human? I have uh, a huge, there are two of my passions that I really have uh, sometimes a little bit of embarrassment to tell people. One is magic, that I'm a huge fan of, of illusionists and card magic. And the second thing is uh, stand-up comedians. And, and the reason is there are, there's a great line, and, and I, I forget who said it, um, and it was like, you know, comedians are seen as the modern day philosophers. And, you know, who really that does a disservice to modern day philosophers <laughs> because these are people who are speaking truth, their own truths. And, and we all have, and I don't know if I'm allowed to swear here, but they oh, have, yeah. they have bullshit detectors. Right. Yeah. And, and I think what, what you've kind of, what you touched on is that human beings have some organ in them that they know when someone is being honest and genuine and real. And what I've found I've, I've met many singers, songwriters who tell you the same thing when they find, when they tap into that authenticity, when they tap into that raw emotion, the more specific you are to yourself, the more universal people, the more universal it is that what might be something that I feel I'm the only human on the planet who's ever experienced. Once you express that other people, go, I'm just like that. Yeah. So I, I think that's what I think. That's what I think when I hear of authenticity and, and, and being real. And, and the reason I say I'm a fan of magic is because magicians know how to deceive, but they do it honestly and openly. Yeah. So they're being real about it. You know, they say, here's a trick. I'm going to do something that you're not going to believe and you're going to enjoy it. And then we're all going to move on with our lives, but you're being deceived in a really transparent way, as opposed to what sometimes happens to us in life. Completely. Uh, yeah, was, I kind of see the parallels between uh, magic and comedians, as well as with authenticity as uh, almost a paradox, a very like interesting one that I could really sit and chew with for a, a while. But it's again, with the transparency, hey, I'm doing 
X for Y, not I'm doing X for, you know, marshmallows or something. By the way, I, I have horrible analogies. <laughs> we, we added up rainbows and sunshine the other day <laughs> to Perfect. get numbers. Like you just kind of, you, you go with it. Apparently it's memorable. I don't know. Uh, authentic, right? And mm -hmm. if I can show up to class and be my authentic self, hopefully that um, allows people to be vulnerable because as learners, literally learners are the bravest human beings because they're showing up to something and saying, I don't know. Because that's what a learner is. There's somewhere where I want to be and I'm here and I don't know how to get there necessarily. And it's our job as uh, as educators, as educators, broadly speaking, right, mm -hmm. uh, to help guide along learners because we're also learners. And if we're not learning, gosh, I don't know. It's, yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. So you're somebody that's talked to probably, gosh, not hundreds, like thousands, if not tens of thousands of people. So when I talk about management learners, what are some observations or some experiences that you've had, maybe that you collected uh, some themes that you might want to point out that might be helpful to management learners, possibly something that they have, you know, thought about before, or perhaps not thought about before. It can be a new take or it can be reinforcing something that you're like, this is important. Listen mm. up. Mm. Oh, that my brain's going in a thousand different directions all, all at once. And part of that is uh, every time I've been in a situation where a management or a group has tried to examine what challenges there are within an organization, and I've worked for media companies, radio stations, and newspapers, and it's always about communication. Every single problem that arises is because of ineffective communication. And part of that is there's this propensity to promote and elevate people to positions of management because they did the job or the task really well. Mm -hmm. But yet, when they're put into a different role, they're not necessarily given the same opportunity for growth and learn and, 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 and progression because they aren't given any kind of training on what it takes to manage people. Mm. It's one thing to manage a department with goals that are clearly defined or sales targets that everyone understands or budget constraints that people have to live within. But it's the people that are working within that institution or that organization that have to execute those goals. And at one point, I remember not too many years ago, there was this idea, no, in order to help move your your employees forward, you need to give, if you're going to criticize, you give them a compliment and you give them the criticism and then you give them something else that's pot. Oh, the shit sandwich. The shit sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, that was something that was promoted by people who I feel were managers because they did the tasks well and that they didn't necessarily understand the people or perhaps how to motivate and energize the people to reach the goals that they're expected to attain. I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, I think it's it's really good. It's a different skill set, right? It's managing people versus doing the thing. And are they mutually exclusive? No. Um, but are they are they one for one? Is one training for the other? No. So figuring out the gaps and and folding into it. Actually, I feel like you're you're my hidden plant. Um, an upcoming guest are a pair of uh, organizational behavior profs at our school. Uh, people that uh, I hope our learners will have an opportunity to take a class with. Both are award winners, uh, researchers, and and uh, educators. And sometimes the, the soft sciences, you know, the people that gets a little bit, um, you know, there's like a battle uh, between like the hard, the numbers and the softness. And I'm like, screw the battle. Like it is a collaboration because you have to be so good technically for people to put up with a really poor like behavior and a poor communicator. And it's like, you can rise faster. You can have a better time at work. You can engage more people. You can make an actual like impact and a difference if you have both. So thank you for reinforcing. Absolutely. Perfect. If not better, perfect answer. So thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So you did speak about a layoff, which it's interesting because I'm seeing lots of things on social media now that uh, with the giant tech layoffs, uh, you know, the thousands of the layoffs that people said would never happen. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because I, I'm really excited to see the discussion of it because most people go through their lives being laid off once, twice, sometimes like three times, sometimes three times within one year. So I'm glad that the discussion is out there to kind of destigmatize it. 
Uh, we had a guest on, uh, Gordon, I'll link it below, uh, that talked about how he dealt with his layoff and without stealing his thunder, uh, it involved, um, a very large bottle, uh, a basement, some darkness, um, before he emerged. So I'm wondering what's kind of the process, uh, from if you're willing to share and go there from when you found out, um, to when you, uh, you know, got your next opportunity and any advice that you would have uh, for learners along the way that will likely face something like this in the future. I would actually have to go back to the time before. Uh, and the reason I say that is um, I was in the last role I had very public in the, in the job I was doing and was, I uh, was told, uh, it was given a very rare opportunity that seldom happens in broadcasting, which is yes, your job is over, but you're here for another two and a half weeks. Uh, and that, that doesn't happen very often in that type of uh, situation. Usually your last shift was the one you just did. Uh, which again, I'll say happened to me prior to that. Uh, when uh, the last layoff in uh, October, November of uh, 2020 happened, um, I had that phone call that said, listen, we, I want to meet with you. I want to talk to you. So I had opportunities. So it wasn't necessarily, there was sadness about that moment that was going to end, that things were about to change. But I also knew that Going forward, I had some protection with a contract that was going to pay me that I has, I was not financially concerned in any way. It was more about, okay, I don't know what this next opportunity is going to look like. So there was some, uh, there were a few nerves, but it, it was more trying to deal with the emotions of what I've known for the last seven years. My daily routine is, is about to be drastically changed and perhaps will never return. Uh, but it was after I was a about 10 years in a job as a, as the news director that I referred to earlier in this conversation, uh, that I finished a shift was called to an office. As soon as I saw the two managers, I went, Oh, I already told you your first offer is never going to be good enough. And I'm not signing anything till I talk to a lawyer. <laughs> and that for me was a little bit different because that was my whole life. I, I had spent every bit of my energy invested in that. And it was, I felt that was defining who I was as a human being. Uh, so sitting at home, you know, and it's kind of a weird situation where, yeah, I was on the radio yesterday. Today, the radio is still there. I'm not a part of it. That was for me a bit more challenging. And I spent, you know, a good few weeks, as I used to say, uh, cooking and, and making rolls and making bread and, and the bread went away and the rolls all stayed for a while. <laughs> uh, but that to me was okay. That define that was a defining moment because I said, okay, from this moment on, I can never let someone else dictate my journey. I can't rely on others to make the decisions that are best for me because they'll only make the decisions that are best for their situation for whatever reason. Uh, so for that, from that moment on, whenever I'd had a student or, or a journalism student that I was as a mentor or working with as a, a, a co-op student, I would tell them the same thing. Plot your, try and come up with and define where your career should go, where you'd like to see it go and then do what you need to do in order to make that happen. If you rely, if you get comfortable and if you rely on other people to, to uh, plot your path, they'll always do what's best for themselves and not necessarily for you. So for me, yeah, it wasn't easy, but it was, uh, it, I took what I could from that, learn from it and, and then made my decisions accordingly. Although in the end, somebody else made a decision that was outside of my control that dictated my future brought in part because the pan of the pandemic and i'm not saying it was because of the pandemic but it was because of the, what the what was the result of that which is a, a lack of uh, businesses and revenue and all that that came along there was no real way to look at it any other way is that you know the the industry changed dr drastically because of what had happened and was ongoing for you know a year and a, and a bit so Completely. It was ongoing and it was the unknown ongoing, right? What did they say in the be beginning with the pandemic? Hey, we're going to be shut down for two and a half weeks yeah. or two weeks. Flatten the curve. <laughs> Flatten the curve. Okay. So, Flatten you know, right. I think it's super relatable to a number of people who have dealt with a uh, number of things, seen it with their families, seen it themselves, seen it at school. You know, online learning is a great thing when the purpose and design was online learning, right? Uh, online learning is... Um, not a good thing, in my opinion, when it is the thing that we do um, because like we have to and we're here and we're going to make the best out of it. Um, I'm I'm still I'm reflecting on that. Um, and 
I hope I contributed to part of the solution. And uh, it, it really is one of those things where you really just have to lay it on straight with learners and lay it on straight and just speak to things as it is. We did the best that we had and nobody knows what what that what that blueprint should look like or did look like. But what I love is you, it sounds like now a diversifying opportunities, diversifying identity and understanding, you know, the locus of control, what can I do versus saying, oh, I'm going to find um, a company to take care of me. Right. I think that that maybe would have been, uh, you know, my dad's dad's generation, um, where that was the case that they had to define benefit. You were there with one company from 20 to 60, uh, to, you know, and they'll take care of you till 80. And that was, that was normal. And our norms have changed and, uh, you know, society and the norms will continue to change. So building up your skill set, being a good human communicating, sounds like all, all wonderful things to kind of encapsulate there. Okay. I'm going to throw a shot in the dark out. Okay. Um, is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, you said Esteban, and I was on a plane a uh, week and a half ago, uh, the night or the day after the World Juniors were hosted here in Halifax. Mm -hmm. And seated next to me was a gentleman, I believe his name was Peter uh, Tetarelli, and he is the Calgary Flames play by play announcer. Uh, he also did a stint, I believe he uh, started his first broadcasting gig in Esteban. Uh, you both have lovely voices. Is there any chance uh, that you and um, the Calgary Flames play by play announcer. I uh, have crossed paths at all. No, the name okay. doesn't really ring any bells. Uh, but again, it was 1989 Listen, when I was there. So I'm, I'm all about the long shots because, like, you're <laughs> ge you're generally in like the same age group. It's interesting because yeah. there's like, um, you know, the the video of our world and our life where it's like you two were like exiting the studios, like. <laughs> Uh, or like in a bar and like one was leaving one was coming in so yeah. you never know I always feel like those uh weird coincidences but hey sometimes uh they don't work out all righty um podcast or book recommendations um you, you don't have to tailor them to management learners necessarily but like what do you like uh where do you go to kind of get your fix I have had so many books uh, provided to me for review. And I, I, I really enjoy biographies or autobiographies. I really love hearing people's stories. So for me, that's really exciting. Um, we just, uh, we just recently bought my mother-in-law a copy of, uh, Harry's book, the spare. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I know she'll chew through that quickly. So I'm hoping to get that to, uh, to read just to kind of get his, his take on what had happened. Yeah. Um, there's actually a, a professor that I know who's had a book. It's, it was been out for a while now, but it's called, it's not about us. And his name is Todd leader. And, uh, he had, uh, uh, some successes in, in working in the administration of psychology and, and mental health. And he really did a lot of deep thinking and a lot of introspection on trying to help medical health professionals know that if they're going to be effective and it's really timely now because he, again, he wrote this book about three or four years ago that when you, when, when an industry or an organization is only so self-absorbed or so self-focused that they forget who they're really serving, that it's missing an opportunity to help people in a way that they all want to help how people and to make a difference in people's lives. But it's, it's like, okay, well, no, you're not sick enough. You know, if you show up, you're not sorry. I know you're not well, but you're not sick enough yet for what we can offer to you. Or perhaps I'm not working weekends. I'm not working evenings. The times when people need you, you're not there. So I just really felt uh, this was a, a document, a book, a, a person's life's experience who made the changes that he ended up writing about that made a difference. And then just through his circumstance, um, because people don't want to be shifted from their pedestals or their worldview that it didn't work. So it's, it's one of those things that I thought was a, a, a missed opportunity that people didn't recognize the potential in what he was describing, which was simply don't look inward, look outward and, and make things work for the people that you're trying to serve. And if you do that, you'll be successful. I love it. I have made a note. It's not about us. Uh, thank you. It makes me uh, think about a bit of research that I heard about a while back, as I like to dabble in the happiness items. I know that myself, I probably have a fairly high set point, meaning some stuff can happen and I'll like probably bounce back to relatively high and like high highs will happen. I'll like bounce back probably pretty high. 
Um, but I, th I think it also likely comes from a bit of a cynical place. <laughs> uh, so it's not like all, you know, sometimes the rainbows like we talked about before. But what they said is that if you have $20 um, and you they gave it to two groups of people and the one group who was told you can't spend it on yourself uh, ended up being happier, reported happiness like in the moment and ongoing than the group that had to spend it on themselves. And so the takeaway was, you know, if you are just like down in the dumps, if you're just having a bad day and I've been there and it's like, what can I do for somebody else? And it's like the best altruistic, most selfish thing that you can do. And you like end up smiling it and coming away. Even if it's like, you know, you buy somebody behind you, it's important, a coffee, uh, you let somebody step in line for you. Like, you know, you just do something for somebody else. So thank you. Um, as a kind of a bigger, it's not about us. And how do we find purpose and success in our careers by looking outward? So thank you. Uh, that leads us to kind of the second last thing, which is the big question that I like to ask all my guests. Some hate it, some love it, uh, but I'm going to ask you, Sheldon McLeod, what is your definition of success? Oh, I hate that question. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you just shattered my soul. Like imagine no, 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 no. you have no. an expert in the field that is like, that is a shit job. <laughs> no, the, the, the reason that I love that question is that uh, it, it can change. My definition is going to change from day to day. And I think think if I were to define what I think success would look like is integrity aligned with ambition, aligned with behavior, aligned with comfort in the outcome regardless. That no matter, as long as I stay true to myself, as long as I work to my best abilities, as long as I give all of myself, I won't give the, that old cliche of 100%, 110%. That's mathematically impossible. And then to know that regardless, the outcome is the outcome. And I can't change that. Once the decision, once the die is cast, the it's it's over, it's done. So for me, if, if I can be, if I can square that, if I can be cool with that, that's success. If I can I'll legitimately say, if something failed, that I did everything in my power, everything within my ability, to, to be, to, to reach that goal. And it still doesn't happen that I did the best that I could. And that would be a success, even though on the surface, it might look to others as a failure. I read something the other day on, on Twitter and yeah, I'm still on that platform. Uh, someone who said what, what we tend to do is we go through life and we don't recognize that there's not a single other person on this planet who sees you the way you see yourself. You only exist in your own mind, the way you present the way you, you know, all your secure insecurities and, and successes only exist within your own being. And in the moment that you forget that not anyone else sees you the way that you see yourself, then you're, you're missing the point. And the point, you know, being, as I feel it, the success is if, as long as you do as, as good a job as you can, and, and you're, you're satisfied that you didn't leave anything on the table, or you didn't leave anything in the bullpen, uh, any other sport analogy that I really don't uh, care to get into because I don't really like sports. Uh, I mean, uh, again, that, that's how I would define success. Brene Brown reminds us that our best looks different every day and that by showing up, we are literally doing our best because that's in the context where we're at. Thank you for showing up, doing your best and allowing me to try out and do my best today as Sheldon McLeod. If our learners or any one of our internet citizens uh, wish to reach out to you, um, what's the best way to do so? Oh, uh, email uh, sheldon.mcleod at saltwire.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm still trying to fight to get my old uh, Twitter handle back, but it's uh, at the S. McLeod show. I'm on Facebook. Uh, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media that uh, you want to be or don't want to be. So that, that's probably the easiest way. And Truth be told, uh, I'm still in the phone book. And for those of you who don't know what a phone book is, uh, it used to be this collection of pages with uh, your, and people think that's breaching privacy. It had your name, your address, and the number that you could be reached at. So I'm still in the phone book. Oh, that's perfect. Uh, hey, it used to be a good sports uh, fundraiser where you get sports teams to like bring the phone books door to door to door to door to door. Oh, that's a good one. Awesome. I'll link all that information down below in the show notes. Uh, Sheldon McLeod uh, from Saltwire. Thank you so, so much for coming on. I uh, really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for the invitation, Sam. <laughs>